Welcome back, folks. In the last section of this chapter, we're going to talk about testing means when we have paired samples. So we're going to talk about here how to do a hypothesis test and how to construct confidence intervals as well. When we are doing a paired samples test, we want to have two paired or matched random samples. So that means you would randomly sample folks, and then you would essentially sample them again. Right? You're going to sample the same pairs before and after some treatment, or you're going to sample matched pairs. In this case, we have to have large sample sizes, or we have to know that the differences in the matched pairs, and this is important, right? the differences in the scores in the paired scores come from a normal population, right? so that they're symmetrically distributed, and then we can use all of the t-tests that we've been talking about. There are a few things to note when we talk about a paired samples test. Okay? Again, we're, we're sampling the same people twice, before and after some treatment. Right? We're sa sampling two groups that are matched on some particular characteristic. As you'll see an example, we're going to talk about tires here in just a second. So not exactly the same tire, but they're matched on their characteristics in that they are you know, manufactured in the same way. These matched pairs, right? when we test the difference of these matched pairs, we're going to be looking for some type of improvement, right? So if you're looking for an improvement in a treatment, you would expect that the score after some treatment would be higher than the score before some treatment. Okay? And to test that value, instead of testing after and before, what we do is we test the, the mean, or we essentially test the difference between those two scores, right? After minus before, the mean of the group after minus the mean of the group before, okay? And that is what we call the mean of the difference scores or the, it's the mean of the difference scores, okay? Essentially what you would do is subtract each one and then find the mean of those values. We would then find the standard deviation of the difference scores, the difference between A and B for each individual pair, okay? And this value that you see referenced here, which makes my notation here on not all that great, this is the population mean difference, okay? This value will generally be zero, right? But if you expect there to be some improvement in the population, then you can include that value in this test, right? So say that you know some treatment improves a score by five points. You want to see if your treatment improves it by more than five points, okay? So you could include that five points here while still using the before and after paired match that you'll see uh, in this test. In this case, when we are testing for a paired sample test, we are comparing the different scores, right? Or the mean different score, in two samples to the population mean difference, okay? And so if we expect that that population mean difference is gonna be equal to zero, if there's no difference in our group from the population, then the null, the mean difference will be equal to zero. There's no difference between before and after, nothing changes. The alternative is whether it's less than, greater than, or just not equal to zero. And again, we have left and right tail tests depending on less than or greater than, or whether it's different from. And so it's tough to um, talk about the mean difference and the differences of the means, okay? but I think it's going to be easier to understand a little bit more when you see an example. Okay? A paired samples test uses what's called difference scores, okay? or at least that's how I refer to them. It's really just the difference between each paired measurement. Right? So it's just calculated by subtracting one measurement from the other, okay? generally after minus before. If you want to see if a treatment is improving something, right? then you take the after score minus the before score, and if the value is positive, then the treatment is improving, right? the value is improving. Okay? And you compare this difference to the population mean difference. This is very often zero. It doesn't have to be, right? If, like I said, if you already know that a treatment improves something, then you can compare it to that value. But very often we're comparing it to zero. We're looking to see if the difference between our paired samples after minus before is different from zero, right? Did it improve more than zero, right? In this case, the degrees of freedom are going to be the number of matched pairs minus one. Okay, because we only have so many ways that these val values can vary. Okay, and so in this case, it's not based on both samples, but instead we're using just the total number of matched pairs minus one. And that's what you see here for n. It's the number of difference scores. It's how the difference scores vary, because that's what you're comparing in this test. So let's take a look at some examples of a paired samples t-test. A researcher wants to determine if there's a decrease in the frequency of problem behaviors after three months of ABA therapy. So a random sample of 30 students are included in the study. We're going to use a 0.05 level of significance and de determine if the mean reported frequency after therapy is less than the mean reported frequency before therapy. And so these are the values of the number of problem behaviors that were reported for these 30 different students. And then after three months of therapy, 
This is those same values that are reported for those same students. First, we want to state our hypotheses. In this case, we're going to say that the mean difference between the two groups is equal to zero. And so the scores after minus the scores before are equal to zero. Because we're looking to see if the reported frequency decreases, right, then we'd expect that the mean difference would be less than zero. Right? If we want to bring down the number of bad behaviors, then the after score should be less than the before score, and this should be a negative value. And so we're looking then to, to find whether it's less than zero. So here, let's take a look at different scores. Right? In a paired test, right, we look for the mean, we look at the mean differences, right, the mean of the different scores, rather than the differences in the means. Right? In this independent samples test in previous sections, we had the mean of one sample, the mean of the other sample. Right? And those were the two that we compared to find our t-value. It's different here, and this is what makes this test different. And it all has to do with how the data vary. And so rather than looking at the differences of those two samples, we find the different score for each individual person in the group, right? After minus before, nine minus 10 gives you negative one, three minus eight gives you negative five. And now we have a sample of different scores. And we can use the sample of different scores like, almost like a one sample t-test like we we did in the previous chapter. And that's what you'll see here. Now, you can use descriptive statistics to get these values to find uh, the means and the standard deviations. Um, I would tell you that uh, uh, you can just also just do it this way by subtracting in Excel and then calculating the mean and standard deviation. You don't have to use the descriptive statistics. But what I wanna show you here is that after minus before, right? The mean, this is the mean of after, this is the mean of before. Okay? The mean of the different scores is still one minus the other. Okay, the things that are different are the standard deviation. Okay, so don't let that get you confused. Okay, what you are working with is are these values here okay, and not these. You want the mean of the different scores for a paired samples test. Okay, if we do this in this case, the mean of our different scores is negative 2.57. Standard deviation is 3.276 or 277. I might have rounded. No, that's right. And we have a sample of 30 students. And when we calculate our t-value, we get t is minus 4.296. That should be somewhat clear as it's probably significant, but let's find out for sure. If we're dealing with a t-test and you want to find the area in the right tail of a t-test because it's a one-tailed test, you can use this command. Okay, but Excel doesn't have a left-tailed test. And I think it might sometimes it might pretend like it does, but I don't think it works right. There's a reason why I've not used it. I think, but it does have a right-tailed test, which means it gives you to the, the area to the right of your t-value, okay? And so that gives us this, and then we can just do one minus that, okay? Or if you remember that the t-distribution is symmetric, right, then the left-tailed test for a negative value is the same as the right-tailed test for a positive value, and you can get the area this way. Doesn't matter which way you do it, either way will give you the probability. Clearly, our probability though I think I might have an extra zero in here. Nope, clearly our probability is less than our significance level, which was 0.05. And so we are gonna reject the null. There's evidence support that the mean frequency of reported behaviors is less after three months of ABA therapy than before, right? Or the mean number, the mean frequency of reported behaviors is decreased after three months of ABA therapy. So again, like we did in the past sections, let's take a look at these and now we'll just calculate some of these values. A consumer products testing group is evaluating two competing brands of tires, brand one and brand two. So we're looking at tread wear on tires. We're gonna install the two brands on the same random sample of 10 cars. Each car has one tire of each brand on its front wheels, half are on the left, half are on the right. And so they're just switched around so that they're all broken up randomly and evenly. Cars are driven for 20,000 miles. And then they measure the tread wear in inches. And that's what you see in the table. Based off these data, can the consumer group conclude at a 0 0.01 level of significance that the mean tread wears of the brands differ? So to do the tires wear their treads differently. Okay, so this is a good example of a matched group where you're, these two tires are different, but they're matched in the fact that they are, we're comparing the two brands, right? They're both two different brands of the same kind of tire. The null hypothesis here would be that the difference between the two brands, the, diff the mean difference between the two brands would be equal to zero. The alternative is that the difference, and here we want to know if just the tread wear differs, so if it's different from zero. Right? So the difference in mean tread wear of the two brands of tires 
is different from zero. And so we have our hypotheses. Now we want to calculate our test statistic. I went ahead and did some of the subtractions and things in Excel previously, but here we would just subtract brand one minus brand two, and that's going to give us a mean and a standard deviation of the difference scores. And so the mean of our difference score is 0.0514. The expected mean difference is zero, right? If they're the same, then there's, there's no difference between them. The standard deviation, 0 0.0679 divided by the square root of, in this case, there are 10 cars. That's 0 0.0514 divided by 0 0.0215, and 2.9, I'm sorry, 2.3, 2.394. And so now we have our T value. If we want to determine our significance, let's see, I don't think we, we can use either method here. All right, first, our critical T value in this case, we can get from Excel equals t dot inv dot 2t because remember, it's a two-tailed test. We have a 0.01 level of significance and 9, 10 minus 1 degrees of freedom. And so our critical t in this case is going to be 3.25. So way over here, you can't really see it on this side. Our t value that we calculated, 2.394. And so about here-ish, should be on the other side, I'm in the wrong spot on the other side. Clearly not within the rejection region. And so we would fail to reject the null here, but we can also find the p-value, right? In Excel equals t.dist.2t, 2.394 and nine degrees of freedom. So we get a p-value of 0 0.0402, which is not less than, this is greater than our significance level. That's not alpha. 0.01. And so again, we would fail to reject, right? It's greater than the significance level. So we fail to reject the null. It doesn't cross the critical value into the rejection region. And so we fail to reject the null. There is evidence to conclude, well, there's not evidence, sorry, there's not evidence to conclude the mean treadwear of the brands differ. Treadwear of the two brands differ. We can also use confidence intervals, as you saw in the past two sections. Prepared samples here, we're going to use the mean of the different scores, our critical t-value, and then the standard deviation of the, the different scores. And again, if the confidence interval contains zero, then there's no difference between before and after. There's no difference between the matched groups. A group of eight individuals with high cholesterol levels were given a new drug designed to lower their cholesterol levels. Okay, they were measured before and after. We want to construct a 90% confidence interval for the mean reduction in cholesterol levels. And so we want to know how much it went down. So here are our before scores. Again, I did a little bit of this in Excel. This is going to probably be the easiest way to do this unless you want to write all this stuff out. Okay, but if we do after minus before, right? So in this case, after minus before, and that's why these are negative because it's going down. Okay, and then we find the mean and the standard deviation of these values. That's what you see here. Okay, this is our mean of the different scores. And this is the standard deviation of the different scores. Now, to calculate our confidence interval, negative 79.375. Okay, so it's, that's how much it's reduced, plus or minus. We need our critical T value. That's the one thing we're missing. The critical T value for, back up just a little bit, a 90% confidence interval. Okay, and we have seven degrees of freedom and minus one. So the critical T value, remember these are confidence intervals are two-tailed, okay? and we had a 90% confidence interval and seven degrees of freedom. If we plug that into Excel, we can get our critical T value, 1.895. Critical value is 1.8995. And so here we have plus or minus 1.895, a standard deviation of our different scores, 38376, divided by the square root of our sample size, which was eight, negative 79.375 plus or minus, plus or minus 8.967. And now the numbers are a little bit, um, they can be a little tougher because they're negative, I guess. But if we um, add or subtract 8.967 to our difference score to get our confidence interval, we can be 90% confident that our values will fall within. So if we find negative 79.375 plus or minus 8.967, we can be 90% confident 
that the mean reduction in cholesterol levels in milligrams per deciliter or whatever it was, is between 88.342 and 70.408. And so it's going to be reduced. That's why it's negative reduced by that much. And so again, zero is not included here. And so we would see that this would be a significant reduction, right? Our p-value would be less than 0 0.05 because this would be different from zero. Right? We've shown that we can be, I'm sorry, a p-value would be less than 0 0.10 because it's 90%. But we've shown that we can be 90% confident that the difference is not zero. Right? And so we, this is how you can answer more questions about, about data, but you can also learn answers to your hypothesis tests as well. Right? This is how you can use confidence intervals to sh still show the answers to hypothesis tests. And this is why you'll see both in research that you read. That is the end of this chapter. In the next chapter, we'll talk about correlations and regressions, at least briefly, before the end of the course. Please let me know if you guys have any questions or if there's anything that I can help you with. And I'll talk to you more next week.